So we will now uh, move straight on to our first panel, which is uh, a terrific lineup. Um, David Shore is going to moderate. So if the four panelists could come up and take their seats, they should all be mic'd, and we'll move straight into that. Incidentally, while they're coming up, I'll say that we're going to squeeze the, uh, the, the break. Um, in fact, we probably won't take an official break between this panel and the final one, uh, but you're welcome at any time to get up and get a cup of coffee or do whatever you need. Thanks. For you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks to uh, Matt for setting things up, for inviting us. We indeed, as he said, uh, have a, an excellent panel, um, very well-informed experts to uh, help orient us for the upcoming summit. Um, do we all, we all have our mics on? Uh, I just want to make start off with a few scene-setting points. Uh, if the G20's image has, uh, has faded as a place where big things get done, to, to a good extent, that, uh, it's a victim of its own success, right? Um, if you save the global economy from the uh, brink of uh, cataclysm, uh, what do you do for an encore, right? Uh, that, that's its, its main problem. Um, and I, I would say that it hasn't always been clear uh, what it's doing for an encore, and I, I don't mean that as a slam, um, but I, I mean that as a constructive con critique, and that's what I'd uh, like to have you keep in mind as you're listening to all the issues that the, uh, the G20 is dealing with. Uh, you know, the, the knock against the G20 is that it's trying to do too many things, but I think that misstates the problem. Um, it is true that there are sort of a lot of things sort of washing through and flowing through the G20's inbox. Um, but really, for some of those items, it's fairly passive. For, uh, for others, it's you know, pretty much hortatory uh, or aspirational, right? Uh, and so really the point, and, and I'm picking up somewhat on what Caroline Atkinson said before, um, the point isn't to focus exclusively on the top priorities, uh, but the point really is just to use the process well. Um, and by that I mean only deal with things where the leaders really can you know, advance things, can push the ball down the roll, uh, down the, the field rather, um, whatever the issue, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's really about being clear, if you will, about the theory of change for an issue, right? Where are we trying to get and how? Um, and, and that's the, you know, the way that I'd like to, to hear all of our uh, experts talk about things. You know, so when, when uh, we um, G20 wonks talk about streamlined communiques, in a way what we're saying is that communiques should merely be clear in stating um, you know, what advancements are being made on a given issue in, in different ways. Um, so uh, as I say, I'm going to be asking um, what, uh, what we're doing for an encore. Uh, as someone who's, who has been an advocate for the G20 to do more, to deal with more issues, uh, a wider range, um, as someone who's spoken up for the G20's ability to deal not just with top tier issues, but with uh, other issues as well. And again, I was delighted to hear uh, Caroline Atkinson pick, on that, uh, pick up on that theme. Um, uh, I do want to be clear as I as I turn now to uh, Mark Sobel from uh, from the Treasury Department. Uh, we are all aware what the top tier is, right? There's there's not confusion what the core job and mission of the G20 is. Um, it it has its three you know, main marching orders, um, and I'd like to hear an 
uh, an update on them, the, the, the uh, micro, macroeconomic imbalances um, uh, between export and consumer demand, uh, financial regulatory reform, uh, the problem of too big to fail, the uh, Basel capital requirements, uh, derivatives regulation, and then uh, what people, I think, sometimes forget is also the, the third pillar of the core of that agenda is uh, international financial institution governance reform. And um, there was a, an agreement for changes to IMF quotas in 2010, and so there's some follow-up issues on that. So if you could you know, give us a, a bit of a snapshot where we are with those. Okay. Uh, thank you. So. Uh you would like me to address all of them in one fell swoop. <laughs> um, as efficiently as you can. As efficiently as I can. Nobody's ever accused me of efficiency. Um, so let me address your question against the background of uh, the G20 finance ministers meeting next week that will take place in Moscow. This will be uh, the last finance ministers meeting this year preceding the leaders summit uh, in September. Um, so let me just Turn to the issues one by one. Um, so in terms of the global economy, I think the background for the minister's discussion uh, remains l largely unchanged. So while tail risks have been avoided over the last year, global growth remains too weak and unemployment is too high. It's quite simple. Uh, but in other ways, the current situation has evolved. Uh, in the US, uh, recent data show that the recovery is well on track. Private uh, domestic demand is growing around 3%. Labor market conditions are steadily improving. And while headline growth of uh, around 2% is being held back by large fiscal headwinds, the GDP uh, growth should strengthen uh, over the through the end of 2013 and uh, into 2014. The fiscal deficit in the U.S., 7% of GDP in 2012, should drop to 4.6%. Uh, this year, according to the administration's projections. Um, the administration's forecasts also show a uh, declining debt-to-GDP path uh, from 2016 through the forecast horizon in 2023. So the U.S. is meeting the uh, fiscal commitments set forth in the 2010 Toronto summit, but frankly, we are consolidating faster than is desirable to uh, support uh, our economy. The outlook elsewhere uh, is more challenging, however. Uh, Europe remains uh, a serious global risk, despite welcome, welcome progress in building stronger firewalls. Uh, Europe's recovery matters enormously to the United States, uh, but Europe remains mired in recession. Uh, private uh, demand has shrunk for eight consecutive quarters. Welcome agreements have been struck on backloading consolidation in some countries and some indicators have improved. Still, the outlook is uh, highly clouded. Fiscal policy remains pro-cyclical. And uh, the economic outlook continues to, to depend on net exports. And within Europe, uh, as you know, there is a continuing strong pressure on the periphery to adjust via contraction rather than increasing uh, domestic demand in large surplus nations. The short-term Japanese outlook uh, has been bolstered by Abenomics. Like others, we are keenly interested in the third arrow of structural reform, which is critical for a lasting return to growth. It is important that Abenomics operate through domestic demand. Uh, Chinese financial markets were recently impacted by interbank market tightness that many analysts believe will lower credit expansion and growth. Uh, Asia's chronic external surplus is an ongoing impediment to global rebouncing. Emerging market growth looks weaker. Uh, volatility in global financial markets has picked up lately. Uh, overall, we remain uh, concerned that prospects for global rebouncing outside the U.S. are discouraging. Uh, the U.S. cannot be the world's importer of first and last resort. Um, on the international regulatory uh, agenda, uh, we see this as successfully moving forward. Uh, sorry, the international financial regulatory uh, agenda. We, we see this agenda successfully moving forward with the United States leading the way. Progress is unmistakable, 
And today's regulatory regime is far more robust than before the crisis. Uh, the US banking agencies have issued their final Basel III rules. Uh, Basel 2.5 and 3 have clearly strengthened the quality and quantity of capital uh, around the world. Further to that end, the uh, surcharge on globally, systemically important banks has done so. U.S. banks already meet the Basel III capital standards, and the largest 18 U.S. bank holding companies, which represent more than 70 percent of the total assets of the system, uh, have a common equity tier one ratio above 11 percent. We're also working in the U.S. on proposed rules to establish a leverage ratio for large firms above the Basel III required minimum and the combined amount of equity and long-term debt these firms should maintain to facilitate orderly re resolution. Uh, Europe uh, has just put in place its directive to implement Basel III. It's important to adhere to the underlying Basel text and treat risk-weighted assets consistently across borders. Progress has been made also on cross-border resolution frameworks with the aim of helping ensure taxpayers never again have to bear the costs of a crisis of the magnitude we saw. The uh, FSB has put forward key attributes for effective resolution regimes, which the United States has already implemented. The FDIC's single point of entry approach will allow subsidiaries of a failed globally systemically important bank to continue operating worldwide without interruption. Europe is making progress through its bank recovery and resolution directive, uh, which sets forth the proposed depositor preference and creditor hierarchy regime plus the associated financing. And Brussels just proposed a single resolution mechanism for uh, the euro area. So uh, another key aspect of the agenda that we've been discussing very heavily since the crisis is OTC derivatives. Uh, the CFTC has already designated credit default and interest rate swaps for mandatory clearing. They've registered some 75 swap dealers and launched significant trade reporting. Uh, we see others as behind. The, the crisis showed how destructive the risk from cross-border OTC derivatives can be, and that close alignment globally is critical to avoid regulatory gaps. Yesterday, the European Commission and the CFTC reached a significant agreement on a common path forward on derivatives to bring transparency and lower risks to the global swaps market. It's a key event. And progress has also been made uh, recently in developing final international standards for margin requirements for uncleared derivatives. Uh, the U.S. is also tackling the risks of shadow banking. The FSOC issued recommendations for public comment to reduce the risk posed by money market funds. And the SEC has recently proposed regulations uh, intended to do so. So uh, the international regulatory reform agenda is extensive, it's nitty gritty. But the key areas I've described above, I think they show that robust progress is being made through the FSB standard setting bodies and bilateral dialogues in building a more resilient uh, global uh, financial system. So um, turning to architecture, um, um, there's, was, a, there's an uh, issue, I guess, with um, congressional approval of, yeah. of the 2010 agreement. Familiar with it. <laughs> <laughs> you um, can enlighten us further. Um, so, um, I think Caroline uh, outlined a lot of the uh, issues uh, that are on the table. Um, there, there are quite a few issues in uh, in the uh, international architecture space, there's issues about uh, sustainable uh, lending, regional financing arrangements, uh, public debt management guidelines, and the like. And so I, I want to make sure that uh, uh, the audience understands that there is uh, a, a comprehensive agenda. And I know that um, uh, our Russian friends are pursuing the agenda and that our Australian uh, colleagues will be uh, taking up many of these issues uh, next year. Now, I mean, on quota, the quota issue, um, you know, this is uh, a top priority uh, mm -hmm. for us. We are very focused on uh, securing legislation. Uh, you know, 
all of us are working very hard to do so. And uh, well, we should. Uh, the IMF is, um, in our view, a great triumph of international cooperation. It's an invaluable organization. Uh, if anybody's read uh, Ben Stiles' recent book, uh, it just shows how integral and seminal we were in creating this august uh, institution. It's really served the world's interests, but our <coughs> interests extraordinarily well. It contributed to the post-war development uh, and reconstruction of Europe and Asia. Uh, it um, has helped us deal with debt crises in the 80s. It helped us deal with the uh, transition economies, um, uh, bringing them into the system in the 90s. David Lipton will be here. It's something he and I worked very closely on. Uh, and great moment in history. Uh, the fund uh, was instrumental in tackling the emerging market crises uh, of the 90s and early 2000s. And the 2000s. Government, governance reforms are basically just to catch up the governance system with yes. changes in, in the world yeah. economically. Um, exactly. Um, now, the fund is also the first responder uh, in in crises, it always has been. And as such, it's very uh, supportive of US uh, interests. When, when there are problems overseas, uh, it hits our economy. It reduces uh, our exports, it reduces jobs, uh, good jobs in the US economy. It uh, reduces foreign direct investment flows into the United States. We've seen that financial instability abroad can uh, create financial market impacts, which impact uh, you know, Americans 401k if we didn't uh, have the IMF, we'd have to invent it. So, you know, you're absolutely right. The United States has been at the forefront in supporting modernization of the IMF and the governance reforms to uh, reflect the growing realities of the uh, growth in the emerging markets. Um, that remains something we support. At Pittsburgh, we were very instrumental. I mean, we drafted and, you know, brokered uh, the, uh, the the agreement about increasing the uh, share of dynamic uh, emerging markets by at least 5%, which was reflected in the 2010 uh, deal. So, you know, currently, um, and as has been the case, the U.S. is the largest shareholder in the IMF. Uh, we have tremendous influence in this institution, um, and I think we need to preserve that leadership position. And. Uh, the budget proposal that we'll submit, that we've submitted, uh, provides for doubling the quota, but it also provides for a corresponding reduction in the uh, in the our NAB. Um, so we're not putting uh, one new dollar into the fund, but it's uh, important to move forward with the uh, 2010 reforms. Uh, we are seeking to do so, and it's uh, important for the world. It's also important, I think, to uh, promote uh, and protect uh, U.S. leadership and, uh, in the fund and its capacity to support an open, growing, and resilient economy. So my last sentence, the, leaders, the ministers will have plenty to talk about next week in Moscow. Never, never a problem that they have. Uh, yeah, the, the reforms in governance, um, they do affect more reducing European voice and increasing uh, Asian voices and also emerging economy voices, just to be clear on that. As I was uh, listening to you, Mark, and thank you for that excellent presentation, uh, I was thinking about the, the juncture between the longer term uh, economic challenges and the immediate term, um, because those, uh, those issues of imbalances sort of sit right there at, at the juncture of the two, that some of the things that are you know, needed to uh, have strong, sustainable, and balanced growth over time, which is the, the uh, watchwords of the G20, um, are also things that are needed to, for a stronger recovery. Um, turning now to Gary Littman of the U.S. Chamber, uh, we, we heard in uh, both of the earlier presentations discussion of trade and uh, I'd like you to, to pick up there. I do remember at the Khan summit that uh, the, the leaders were bold in a strange way to say, 
we finally acknowledge that Doha really is going poorly and we're not sure it's going to work out. So what they did was some truth telling as, as Caroline uh, alluded to. And now we have this interesting dynamic with the uh, Pacific and Atlantic, the, um, the, the TPP and TTIP, if I can keep those straight. Um, what's your read on uh, global trade talks and, and these regional, regional trade talks and how they relate to one another? Um, <coughs> thank you, David. I think it's important to discuss these issues in the context of where the private sector was at the moment of the crisis. Uh, frankly, we were stunned. Right? After Lehman Brothers collapse, the corporate community was in a state of shock. And we were astounded to see the government, US administration, and others being able to respond so quickly and stand up G20 as indeed the premier forum to address the economic crisis. Companies that we represent, they trade all over the world. But each market is seen as a particular market. You try to adjust there. You try to develop your business there, grow that market. Um, for corporate leadership to see governments being able to respond so quickly, much faster than we were able to understand what were the roots of the crisis and how the global economy would evolve, <coughs> was a humbling experience. And uh, I think G20 deserves a huge amount of credit for getting together and sending us a signal that we should do two things. We should try and regain the confidence of the regulators, of policymakers, that we know what we're doing, that we understand global risk, we understand our responsibility and capacity to generate, regenerate growth, uh, and that we will play by the new rules. Second step in that was for us to, in the private sector, to also call each other. What we did instantly, the business leaders of the largest business federations, we all got on the phone amongst ourselves, which we didn't do before that, for competitive reasons, for lack of understanding of each other's capacities. We emulated, in a way, G20. We didn't have all 20, but we had enough 15 CEOs and presidents of the largest business federations, employer groups, got together and we discussed how we can restore the confidence in the markets and what do we think about the government's policy. And we started doing that on a regular basis. We're still doing that. Uh, so by the time of the con, uh, wanted to say festival, summit, um, we were at a point where we were trying to be responsible, a responsible voice for business and looking for ways where we could contribute the most to the uh, restoration of the growth patterns. That's why we pushed each of us individually, national governments, and collectively uh, you know, ins international institutions and G20 to pay attention to trade. But not trade in the you know, classical way of having more negotiations. Our main concern was demand, where will it go? Uh, what will structural reforms proposed by G20 mean to the demand distribution around the world? And how will trade be financed? Uh, the treasuries of companies, the financial experts of the industrial conglomerates looked at their financial sources and weren't sure. You're going to go to the bank? Are you going to hedge your risk? Who's going to finance the major infrastructure project? Where will the money go? And how much will it cost? And what would be the way to uh, reduce the risk? So at that point, our main request to policymakers was, you know, give us a signal. Give us a signal of how trade will be financed in the future, where might be the next sources of demand and where we shouldn't expect much. And, you know, trade negotiations, good. Let's not jettison that. Trade was not the problem. Trade was, and, and trade organizations and trade negotiations should be the culprit. Eventually, as the, the acute phase of the crisis receded, 
we uh, in the business community thought that, okay, protectionism was contained, let's put it that way, or did not take the most egregious forms. Now, how can we contribute to economic growth? And while WTO is important, and we all support the negotiations there, we needed a quicker response, a quicker and not very costly stimulus to the global economy. That's one of the reasons we all started supporting regional trade agreements, um, you know, and trying to put pressure on the governments to, to do it faster, be more ambitious. It's an important way to stimulate our own interest in taking risk if we see that markets will be available. Um, in St. Petersburg in, uh, in June, we had another round of debates with corporate leaders and uh, business federations about the dynamic between regional agreements, regional negotiations, and WTO. You know, you can debate philosophy, companies are thinking, where am I going to sell? And we cannot wait forever for Geneva. So what we did, we collectively agreed to put pressure on regulators to focus on trade facilitation. Trade facilitation meaning making the movement of goods more frictionless. Uh, remove the bottlenecks of the customs, make sure that we don't create, you don't throw sand in, into the system, make sure that customs offices show up in process, make sure that, you know, uh, nuisance regulations don't emerge at the borders. Uh, and WTO has done enough in that area, so we hope by the time of the Bali meeting there could be some progress there. But it's not uh, kind of an either-or situation. WTO is essential, and with Russian uh, accession to WTO, we very much are interested in seeing how this you know, large economy, huge economy, sixth largest in the world if you combine EU, will shape WTO process, will bring new agenda there, new energy, and, and help it move forward. But we cannot wait, particularly in times of economic doldrums, I would say. I think that point uh, about trade protectionist measures can't be stressed strongly enough. It is one of the unsung successes of the G20, I think, because if you, if you do compare um, today to the Great Depression of the 1930s, this is clearly the dog that didn't bark. I mean, so there's a lot of critique made about uh, the fact that you know, there have uh, been some protectionist measures in spite of the pledge uh, to uh, refrain from them. But there, there could have been uh, a lot more, to be sure. Um, so th thanks for that. And I, I now want to turn to um, uh, Amanda Sire from the Australian Embassy. And uh, for those who don't know the reason we're glad to have someone from the Australian Embassy is that Australia is next up as host of uh, the 2014 summit. And uh, so we'd like to hear from you, Amanda, about, about the plans, about some of the basics um, uh, in terms of when the summit, where and when the summit will be. Um, but it would also be interesting to hear from you about um, how the Troika has worked. You know, the G20 now has a Troika system for handing off between um, you know, the past host, current host, and next host. And also, um, Many of us are aware, and you all the more so, that there is an election coming up in Australia. Um, and uh, I'm, that has to, in some ways, complicate things, at least uh, in, in the immediate term. Um, and I, I can only imagine, I guess, that you know, career professionals and career officers like yourself, of course, are, you know, are the ones kind of making sure that the, the continuity is there and, and everything goes well. Okay, well, let me start with, um, I guess, the logistical arrangements and things like that. We're, we're well advanced, I guess, in preparations um, for our host year on that front. The government's already announced the location and timing um, for the Leader Summit, and that's going to take place in Brisbane in November, which is a great place to be. Um, it's announced that there'll be two meetings of G20 finance ministers and central bank governors. Uh, they'll take place in Sydney in February, so quite early, and uh, in Cairns in September in the lead up to uh, the summit. 
And of course, there's always the prospect that finance ministers and central bank governors will meet in the margins of the uh, IMF spring and annual meetings, uh, which take place in September, October, if that's, if that's required. We're very conscious that Australia is a very long way for all of the officials and ministers to travel. Uh, so we, we do bear that in mind in part of the organisation. Um, we, we will have a um, very strong focus on consultation and I think that's evident by the fact that uh, the government's already announced um, the, the domestic engagement groups for business, so the B20 and civil society, and who will lead them up. And I know uh, Richard Goida, uh, who's the West Farmers CEO, has been part of that leadership team on, on the B20 for Australia's host year, has already been active in engaging with the Russian B20 and, and other counterparts around the place to, to gear up uh, and be in a, in a position to, um, uh, to ensure that they can feed, feed into the, the wider G20 process. So we'll have a very strong focus on consultation, uh, both with the non-government sector, of course, G20 members and non-G20 non members. Um, and we are very mindful of promoting continuity across host years. Um, that's critical um, for ensuring we maintain the group's effectiveness, uh, particularly as a lot of the issues that are being talked about, as Caroline um, mentioned earlier, you know, you're in this phase of looking more to the chronic issues that are, that are um, maybe obstacles to, to growth and things like that. These, these can be um, multi-year objectives. They might not be able to be solved in a single year. So that continuity is very important. And the Troika process is critical to that. Uh, we've been working very closely with Russia, the current host, and with Mexico. Um, obviously, the previous chair um, as part of that process um, and my counterparts who are involved in that directly um, are very happy with how that process is working. It's a very, they feel it's a very strong process and of course we'll be engaging with uh, Turkey who will come into the Troika for our host year as well. Um, so we put a lot of emphasis on, on, on that. Um, I guess on, on issues and topics, um, it's probably too premature at this stage uh, with Russia's presidency in full swing to get too much into, into the detail about how Australia will approach its responsibilities in, in the G20 in 2014. Our immediate focus, of course, is working closely with the Russian Sherpa, with the finance teams uh, and others to deliver a strong positive outcome in St Petersburg. That, that, um, that's what we can do to, to hope set up a, a sound basis uh, for 2014, so that's the focus um, of, of what my colleagues are, are actively engaged in. And, um, you know, the final set of objectives that, that's ultimately adopted will very much depend on where some of the current work streams um, end up at the end of this year. Um, but the government, present government, has, um, has made it clear that the, um, the focus on creating jobs and lifting growth at Russia, of course, has is, is, is made a priority of its uh, for its summit um, will be a key theme into 2014 as well. Um, and you see from the IMF's forecasts uh, for global growth, I think the projection for 2013 is 3.1%. Uh, so um, the types of things that Mark was speaking about earlier of looking at addressing um, you know, weak global growth and too high unemployment, these things are likely to be relevant and persistent themes as we move forward. So, so the government has signalled that, that that's likely um, to be a strong theme for 2014 and, and parts of the work streams that Russia has made a priority this year around um, financing investment um, is critical to that. So the enabling of, of, of stronger growth in the private sector in particular and ways ways to address that will be, would be part of that. Um, the former treasurer, who of course um, uh, has been heavily engaged into the, in the G20 process, um, uh, was a very strong supporter of that work stream uh, and um, the engagement Russia had put into it. The other area that the, the, the government has signalled um, it's likely to, to um, continue and pick up is the work that Russia, the UK, the OECD and others have been engaged in on base erosion and profit shifting. But if, if there's already been progress this year. The OECD will report to G20 finance ministers. They've indicated in April that they're keen to have a substantive discussion on that uh, next weekend. So we'll see where, where this evolves to and, and um, in the interests of continuity where Australia might 
might go with that in 2014. Um, but you touched on the elections. There is an election due in Australia sometime between now and the end of November. Uh, the timing of that is not clear. Uh, it's up to uh, the present Prime Minister to announce that. Um, so we're not sure when that will be, whether it will occur before, around or after the summit. And we'll have to wait and see. I, I guess the point I would make, um, it make two points. One, uh, the, uh, we do have a new uh, a new minister representing at us at the finance minister's meeting next week. He's a very capable minister, very experienced cabinet minister um, in the government and very familiar with the treasury portfolio, having been assistant treasurer in the past. And so um, I, you'd expect a bit of continuity with the change of finance ministers there, having worked closely with the government in its thinking around G20 for, for, for many years now. Um, on on the election as a, as a career public servant, um, I should generally avoid speculating on any of these outcomes. The only point I would make is that, um, you know, it has tended to be the case in Australia um, um, across both sides of, of, of the political parties that there's been a strong interest in the fundamentals, um, fundamental macro settings um, and structural basis for economy of what's, what's needed to um, support uh, conditions for strong growth. Um, neither side would would have strong qualms with an agenda focused on lifting growth and creating jobs, which is which is beneficial. And so I'd expect that, um, irrespective of of the election, uh, Australia's commitment to the G20, um, the focus we'll put on it in our host year, um, and the like, will will still be there. Thank you. Uh I should, what I should have made clear in, in uh, turning to Amanda in the first place is that she is the finance ministry's uh, detailee to the uh, to the embassy here, um, and picking up on on your point about uh, consultations, um, just to note quickly that um, Gary's been quite involved in the in the B20, the business 20. He was talking about the sort of parallel process among private sector leaders to the G20, which uh, what you were describing at the outset was probably just uh, you know, loose and, and, um, and self-driven, but then has taken shape as the B20. Um, there is, uh, there's the Civil 20, there's the um, L20, Labor 20. Um, I myself am part of, uh, of the Think 20, which is uh, you know, where we uh, pointy, headeds, uh, pointy heads hang out. Um, and, uh, and so there, there is a, a, lot, a lot to the G20 that um, is not always visible to the naked eye. So I'd, I'd like to, um, since we, uh, we have enough time to the session, we did really want to um, preserve enough for some uh, Q&A and, and to bring you into the conversation. Um, so I'll open the floor. Please, and uh, you know, as before, um, wait for the microphone to come to you um, and be sure to identify yourself. Hi, my name is Noah Feind. I'm representing Patton Boggs. Um, I guess probably this would be best for Treasury, but in terms of TTIP, there are obviously some discrepancies between the European and the American positions. How do you see that playing out uh, in the course of negotiations? Um, you know, I'm not a trade person. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a G20 discussion. You know, I think Carolyn's addressed uh, some of your issues this morning. Do you want to add? Just, uh, we've had this conversation with our European partners in the private sector. It's very difficult to imagine trade negotiations that would not touch on financial services. This is the lifeblood of trade. Now, with the exception of prudential issues and issues that are now addressed at FSB, IOSCO, and other bodies, uh, business community has learned a lesson from the crisis. Keep your financial service providers very close to you. So we want negotiations to be as comprehensive as possible. There was another question here. Uh, 
Hello, uh, I'm Don Lee with the uh, Los Angeles Times. Uh, this is a question for uh, Mr. Sobel. Uh, you described the um, global rebalancing effort as discouraging, and uh, I think it's been, it was the Pittsburgh summit when uh, that effort or commitment was made. Um, where's the, where, has the pro where has some progress been made? Where is it really uh, fallen short, and what is the uh, U.S. strategy to advance that? Mm -hmm. and Further, do you think that can be done without some sort of specific uh, enforcement mechanism? Thank you. Um, you're, uh, you're quite correct at uh, the Pittsburgh summit. Um, we in the G20 advanced the framework for strong, sustainable, and balanced growth. At the, at the heart of the uh, framework was the concept that uh, the world needed to uh, rebalance in a growth-friendly manner. Um, to that end, uh, deficit, it was agreed that deficit countries needed to uh, raise national saving and large uh, surplus nations needed to uh, boost domestic demand, um, as well as uh, uh, pursue greater exchange rate uh, flexibility. Um, there. There has been a, a good, good degree uh, of progress on uh, rebalancing. Uh, you see this in uh, current, account, current account positions um, around the world. There also uh, uh, has been uh, progress uh, in moving towards more market determination of exchange rates. Um, you see this uh, in uh, particular in our discussions with the Chinese. I think there's a stronger consensus. Uh, there, there's a consensus uh, around the need for uh, greater exchange rate reforms uh, in the G20, and we've uh, been able to uh, reiterate the language and build a consensus around more greater market determination of, of exchange rates, enhanced flexibility, refraining from competitive devaluation, uh, and, the, and the like. Um, what, uh, you know, obviously uh, the global economy uh, has evolved in, um, and faced some difficulties uh, since, uh, uh, since Pittsburgh. Um, and one of the key themes that we've tried to emphasize is that it's, uh, uh, we pursue the path of raising national saving that it be in, that countries around the rest of the world uh, boost domestic demand so that, as I mentioned, the U.S. would not be the uh, importer of first and last resort. And so uh, I think as we're looking forward uh, and we see the U.S. Uh, recovery uh, uh, moving forward, uh, you know, we are keenly interested in uh, how the rest of the world will boost domestic demand. I was saying before that um, there's a uh, close positive relationship in, in some ways between uh, longer term concerns and short term concerns. That's, that's not quite always the case though, right? It, there has also been, um, I think, very much in the G20 and what it's dealing with trade-offs between longer term concerns and immediate concerns. So that when Caroline was describing how absorbed the G20 has been with the, the threats um, to the recovery from Europe, um, that, that kind of does suck, uh, suck up a lot of oxygen that could be going uh, towards some of, these, uh, some of these other issues with the longer time horizon. Uh, I'm looking for a next question. I, I can always raise. Thank you. Thank you. Kasia Klimasinska from Bloomberg News. I have a question for Mark Sobel as well about Japan. Uh, if you could please elaborate on your comments about the impact of current Japanese uh, policies domestically and globally. Thank you. 
you know, I think everybody wants to see a strong Japanese economy. As you know, uh, Mr. Abe has put forward uh, a program that rests on uh, three arrows, monetary, fiscal, uh, and structural reforms. Um, I think there's widespread uh, consensus that uh, s strong structural reforms are really uh, crucial to uh, boosting uh, productivity um, in Japan and uh, pr providing a strong foundation for durable uh, growth to complement uh, the macroeconomic policy adjustments. Uh, we're very supportive of that. Um, and what we have said is that um, it's very important that, op that uh, Abenomics uh, operate through domestic uh, demand that it, that it boosts you know, the internal uh, resilience and strength of the economy. So, um, so, that, so that is our focus. Uh, um, and uh, you know, I think there's widespread uh, consensus uh, inside Japan and uh, outside on that. Sure. sure. Right, right there. It's, it's, it's coming. There it is. This is Anna Yukinana from Reuters. You mentioned a bit about global volatility, and I was wondering if you see in what's going on in markets now a need for greater coordination and where that could come from, whether that's something you're worried about or will it sort itself out? Thank you. Um, so let me be very clear. I'm not commenting on monetary policy. That's ex exclusively within the Fed's d domain. Um, you know, volatility uh, has picked up. Uh, and uh, I think we, uh, we, we are, in the United States, we're uh, doing uh, what we can to uh, strengthen our economy, to uh, improve our foundations, to uh, raise growth and lower unemployment. Um, and I think that, um, you know, others around the world uh, have their agendas as well. Um, Europe is trying to uh, build on its firewalls and put in place foundations for growth. Um, and uh, we see efforts towards rebalancing in Asia. So I think that uh, what we need to, uh, to do at, is for people to come together, put in place uh, frameworks that will achieve uh, strong growth to rebalance their economies. That's a strategy, and I think that is the um, best way to boost confidence in the global economy. Financing and investment has uh, come up a couple few times in our discussion so far. I, I wanted to highlight uh, couple more that we haven't focused as much on and, and wonder whether any of my colleagues can um, shed further light. Um, and, th and that's twofold. It seems as if on the, uh, on the development agenda of the G20 that um, uh, financing or, uh, of infrastructure and infrastructure investment has been a major topic. Um, and uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of potential to pay off and growth uh, from investing in infrastructure. The other is uh, climate change financing, um, which n has a relatively new working group in the G20, um, I believe set up just last year, uh, trying to figure out the right relationship uh, between public investment that will draw uh, private investment behind and of course has a, a cross linkage to um, the UN FCCC negotiations where uh, climate financing was a, a big piece of, of, the, uh, of the deal in Copenhagen between um, emerging economies and established economies. So um, as I say, those are, are both coming up in, in the G20 context and I wonder if 
if anyone can add to what I've already described. Uh, <coughs> if I may, David, um, the issue of long-term financing uh, was one of the prime subjects uh, of the discussions among private sector participants in B20 under the Russian presidency. Uh, we had a separate uh, task force organized, uh, chaired by the CEO of the Russian Direct uh, Investment Fund and uh, co-chaired by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Um, most of the participants were long-term investors, um, sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, um, who were describing the fact that um, you know, there are sufficient savings around the world. Australia's superannuation fund alone is what, $1.2 trillion at least, and growing. Um, on the other hand, there is a need to generate growth and jobs and returns, so it's not like uh, there's no need for infrastructure investment, but there's a huge gap. And in, in the time of the crisis and uh, when the markets don't really function that well, that gap needs to be somehow covered. The people with the savings who manage the savings are saying that there are not enough investable projects, while people who promote development, uh, promote projects, are saying that they cannot figure out the access to the money that's out there in the insurance firms and asset managers, etc. So we spend a lot of time uh, discussing what could be done uh, in that respect, what could be the private sector solution or at least uh, indication of directions. A paper will be presented to uh, Mr. Diver I think next week, um, which will say that um, you know, there needs to be a separate reflection stream that would include the World Bank, EBRD, long-term investment funds, and uh, project promoters. One of the biggest disappointments frankly, from the private sector point of view, was when many countries introduced the stimulus. But looking back, we cannot point to any major modernization of our infrastructure that would be associated with that money. Uh, the governments needed to spend something quickly. We supported that. But what was on the shelf at that time was, you know, prisons and potholes. So we need to figure out what are the right projects to finance, what are the new maybe asset classes, what should be changes in the accounting rules that would allow pension funds uh, to underwrite projects. The Russians suggested that we create an informal knowledge network. Uh, I think we will all want to stay engaged in that, and that network will develop some suggestions for policymakers, including on how to do two things, three things actually. One to measure the actual effectiveness of infrastructure investment so you don't create you know, uh, the white elephants in airports that nobody flies to. Um, and then that creates a cost of maintenance that becomes a major problem. Uh, so how do you measure the effectiveness of the return on investment? What changes need to be suggested in the accounting rules that would allow long-term investors to assume more of a risk? Uh, and third, how do you make sure that infrastructure that has been built connects countries rather than just creates insulated markets? Infrastructure that would actually help trade. So we want to think about that. We have uh, a lot of help from, from some of the major consulting firms, and we want to rely heavily on uh, World Bank, EBRD, and uh, the experience of others. Um, on the... Um, Climate finance, I must say when, when the subprime, market, subprime mortgage market collapsed, nobody thought that that would mean also the collapse of alternative energy support in Spain three years later. You know, we need time to figure out what climate finance means today. Uh, and is it different from generating growth? Does it have to be a separate uh, conversation with business? but it has to be conversation with business. That's, that's probably one lesson that we want to communicate to policymakers. Looking for anyone else who uh, wants to come in. A couple of uh, climate 
topics that have come up in our discussion, and I, um, we've, we've just been talking about uh, climate change finance. Caroline talked earlier about the uh, fossil fuel f subsidy phase out. It's a little bit of a tongue twister. Um, but I, I wanted to add a, another idea in sort of the, you, you heard it here, first um, category of, of something that uh, you know, might be good for the G20 or, or somewhere else to get into, and, and that is um, uh, fuel efficiency in, uh, in transportation um, uh, vehicles, um, light duty, heavy duty. And um, because that, you know, that is a sector um, that generates so much of the greenhouse gas problem, um, where uh, technology adoption um, you know, already has some momentum where uh, regulations um, you know, have an important role to play. And uh, it's, it sort of just struck me that uh, in a process like the G20, as John Henry was describing earlier, um, that uh, fuel economy and, and uh, fuel efficiency standards uh, could be um, you know, something very helpful uh, and could make a big difference with, uh, with greenhouse gases. So I sort of thought I'd just throw that one out there. Um, I know that we are supposed to be wrapping up shortly. I was given you know, very strict marching orders for, from Matt, but we do have a few minutes left. Well, I, I just wanted to just come back to financing for investment since it's uh, on the minister's agenda and just say very briefly that you know, we absolutely agree that long-term financing is crucial for you know, allocating sufficient resources to uh, investments, and particularly infrastructure. The, um, the financing for investment agenda, I think, also uh, dovetails uh, very nicely with the President's proposed Rebuild American Partnership to encourage greater private investment in America's infrastructure. We think that one of the keys uh, to uh, mobilizing financing for investment is, of course, to focus on um, domestic uh, enabling environments. That's a very important thing. Um, there's also issues that are being discussed about facilitating a greater supply of, um, uh, facilitating inter intermediation of uh, global savings. Um, uh, and uh, improving processes for planning and prioritization and funding of investment projects. And the last point I wanted to make on uh, financing for investment um, and the reason I spoke is the financing for investment agenda dovetails very nicely with uh, I think what Caroline said and I said and Amanda said, which is our top priority is growth and jobs. Um, and uh, this is, uh, an important aspect of uh, that discussion. Thanks. Do, do either of you want to make some final remarks? Please. Uh, I'll, you know, I, I want to make just one <laughs> statement that G20 has been an amazing source of political signals for the <coughs> private sector. And it, in a way, we've learned a lot by trying to replicate it among companies and business federations, and we've learned how difficult it is to find consensus, how difficult it is to think globally all the time. So for us, G20 is something that we need to support. We need to support very earnestly and bring our best ideas forward. We see its role, frankly, not in addressing collectively the chronic problems of individual markets. They are chronic for a reason. And each of us works on them in our own economy and has been working uh, forever. But as a source of um, assessment of where are the next risks, systemic risks, global risks, what can the governments do together to mitigate them and to manage them? And where can we as the private sector, as people who are supposedly generating the growths, right? the growth and jobs. Where do we come in fairly early on? <coughs> Just like, you know, we see the example of G20 setting up different working groups on long-term infrastructure finance, I believe, 
Germany and Indonesia uh, took the lead. We want to be early on in that process, and not in a competitive sense, us against Chinese, Germans against Brazil. No, but really, we've learned over the last four years the need to stick together and set aside competitive issues. We want to be part of that uh, in terms of risk assessment and solutions. Uh, you, you can rely on Australians, we'll, we'll see the benefit of that. And we also think that we're at a very vulnerable point still. There's a lot that needs to be done, and we appreciate what's been done. And we also want to make sure that you understand the business community, at least the larger companies, are fully aware of the importance of IMF and other international institutions, and are very supportive of continued use leadership there. Many of the conversations I've been involved with around the G20 talk in terms of um, maybe we shouldn't be talking as if we are past the crisis. Maybe we should be talking as if we are still um, you know, in a later phase of the original crisis. Now, uh, Amanda, did you want to? Look, very quickly, you mentioned the, the development agenda before. And I, I guess the point I'd make in, in that, um, that sense is the types of things we've been talking about, um, uh, financing of investment, uh, trade facilitation, um, strengthening the integrity of tax bases. These are all issues that obviously um, developing countries have a strong interest in. So while we often think about the G20 as having different work streams, um, there is a lot of, uh, I think, potential for integration here around the G20 core, core issues and the development agenda. And I think it comes back really to where the, um, the Russian ambassador started and Caroline started, which is when you're looking at a global forum, the G20 bringing together developing and developed countries for these types of discussions really is the appropriate forum um, um, for considering, discussing and sharing views on these issues. Uh, well, those are all, I think, very good uh, benedictions for us to conclude on. Please join me in thanking our panelists for an excellent discussion.